Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. For the first time probably in a decade or so, there's much more rhetoric uh, in public policy about the need to uh, decentralize uh, political and economic power. However, I think it's fair to say that so far, uh, the actual scope of that and the pace of that has not been that impressive. Part of our, the work of our commission is to think about what a future government post-2015 could do if it was really serious about empowering our cities. And the process that we're going to be going through over the next 9 to 12 months is, first of all, a call for evidence where organisations can um, submit uh, their evidence to us uh, and be cross-examined in terms of some of their key ideas. We're also going to be commissioning research uh, into some of the key questions that we want to identify, and we're going to be engaging with policymakers and practitioners through a range of round tables, looking at some of the specific issues, barriers and mechanisms that we may want to explore when we get into the Commission uh, at a later stage. Uh, I don't think we should deceive ourselves about, about the scale of some of the issues that, that, are, that are relevant here. Um, uh, certainly for most of my lifetime, the seemingly ever-ending rise of London relative and the southeast to the rest of the country uh, has, has gone in uh, one direction. There are considerable underlying long-term reasons that, that perhaps uh, drive that. I also want to say in that regard that there is no intention to diminish uh, the importance of London at all in that context. Uh, I, as some of you probably know, I've often described London as the brick capital of the world, and uh, it seems to me London is spectacularly placed, uh, so long as our national and other policymakers don't do too many crazy things, to continue to be a ever-rising uh, important centre of, of this complex modern world and the intention of the Commission is not to subtract from that but uh, to explore uh, some issues uh, to see whether we can help stimulate the virtuous circle juices uh, that could lead to other, other urban areas uh, perhaps not only doing a lot better for themselves, but critically helping to raise the overall national uh, economic performance of the country. To be economically large, you need to have a lot of people working and they need to be productive. And whether it's uh, in China or India or, or many other parts of the developing world or developed world, uh, it is obviously in that regard no coincidence that the main generators of economic activity are urban areas. Uh, and so uh, some of the issues are, are, are very critical um, to what's going on elsewhere in the world, uh, but we can focus more on them ourselves to help our own uh, growth become uh, more sustainable, in, in my judgment. There's often a view here in this country, and maybe in some others, that the relative decline of some uh, regions, especially urban ones, and ones that may be related to being past manufacturing sectors uh, are, are, are things that are just irreversible and there's nothing you can do about it. There are, uh, in my opinion, quite a few examples of, of cities in some parts of the world where they have. Um, mm. When I was first learning about economics at school in the um, early 70s, uh, I specialised in economic geography at the time and, and there was a, a strong view prevailing that uh, Boston and New England was an area that had been written off. I don't know how many people here have spent much time in Boston the past 20 years or so, but uh, that is certainly not a place to be written off in the slightest. It's an incredibly vibrant and dynamic place. Closer to home, uh, Hamburg in Germany is one of the most rapidly uh, expanding urban areas. I think we want to focus a lot more on what you might broadly call, from an economics perspective, supply-side issues as opposed to demand issues. Many regional strategies in the UK have focused on special tax incentives and doing mm. things to try to persuade or coerce or force uh, industry X or Y to go to location uh, A or B. Whereas what 
I think is perhaps evidenced by some of the examples I've said of Boston, perhaps in particular, is doing things about the supply side of an urban area are probably, as difficult as they may be to pull off, things that are going to be more likely to be ultimately successful. So certainly other things to do with local infrastructure, and uh, we will be focusing, I hope, not just on physical infrastructure in that sense, also uh, technological infrastructure, which is obviously especially important for uh, the uh, youth of today and their future, uh, but also things to do with the uh, flexibility and the skill base and the education capabilities and attainment and desires uh, of people too. It seems to me that there is a case for saying uh, that some, if not all, regions or urban areas should be given more uh, autonomy or thought of autonomy in terms of uh, their own financing. Uh, it's the whole notion of whether in fact local authority uh, bonds should be resurrected as a form of financing to allow uh, local authorities to, to make bolder choices about the kind of things they may want to finance for their area rather than having it uh, uh, dictated to from central governments and it and would fit well with at least one part of the current coalition's uh, philosophy on life, that's for sure. The reason why Core Cities is very keen to support the uh, uh, Cities Growth Commission is, be is on a number of different levels really. Um, I mean to start with there's the clear recognition that actually cities are the engines uh, of economic growth in this country. But as a, an organisation that represents the eight largest cities uh, outside of London, um, our agenda is certainly uh, one of looking to rebalance um, the national economy and rebalance the national economy by recognising the roles um, that the core cities can take. And almost uniquely in Europe, um, the big cities outside of the capital uh, underperform the national average in this country. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, um, those regional cities, those big cities, either perform at or above uh, the national economic average. That's a challenge not just for uh, the core cities themselves, but actually it's a challenge for the national economy. Uh, and, you know, um, when you look at the continued growth and uh, rapid growth of, of, uh, of London, uh, and then you contrast that with the, um, the recession it doesn't take too much to project forward and to think that actually what is, what is seen as a benefit in London now may well um, become increasingly a challenge as policy develops to address what will become a challenge um, with the London economy. That in itself will cause difficulties uh, in the regions and, uh, and particularly in the big cities. Um, and yet the core cities collectively uh, have, um, in terms of GBA, uh, generate... Uh, more growth than London, London does. So 27% uh, percent of uh, the national economy uh, is, uh, is attributable to growth in the core cities. If you looked at the performance of the core cities and if that performance in economic terms um, simply match, matched the na national average, you'd be looking at an additional contribution to the national economy of some £1.3 billion. Pounds. And so... Uh, our, our argument, our contention is that actually the core cities can do a good deal more. Um, the core cities have potential for growth um, and in growing uh, would look to, would be able to rebalance the national economy. Oxford Economics uh, have done work for core cities and in that they've shown um, that by 2030 uh, there is the potential through growth in the core cities to generate uh, and an extra £224 billion uh, pounds of GVA and uh, an extra 1.15 million jobs. Um, but it won't happen in the current uh, legislative, the current policy, while uh, you know, the, the position of the core cities uh, is, is one of total or very large dependence on national... Um, national government, national policy and national funding. Um, the core cities collectively uh, retain about 5% of the tax take um, that is generated locally. Now, that's not to say we don't get a good chunk of what the government uh, collects or what we hand over to government back, and we do, but of course as it comes back, it comes back with strings or it comes back through a variety of other agencies to be spent locally and often spent 
uh, against national frameworks and through national agencies um, that, you know, however well they're run, uh, however, um, however sensitive they try to be, can't understand that local variation, um, local need, local difference, which could far better be addressed, in particular around finance, the ability for us to, to keep and use um, in, a, in a, a more discretionary way um, the tax take locally would allow us to um, better address local need, um, better promote local growth, uh, and actually to encourage uh, a greater contribution um, to the national economy. It's not about, you know, the core cities against London. It's just that it is, there is a clear recognition on the part of core cities that we can do more, that we actually want to do more. Um, with greater flexibility uh, and with greater devolution, we could do a lot more, uh, and we could do a lot more to drive economic growth and growth um, in a more balanced way across the UK. The evidence is clear that cities are driving the global economy. Because um, economies are more and more dominated by services, by knowledge, what matters is to businesses, they need access to customers, they need access to skilled labour, and they need access to ideas. And that's what cities offer around the world. It's no accident that it's predicted 70% of the world's population will be urban by 2015. And for those who predicted that uh, the rise of technology would mean the world would be flat, I think they forgot that the reason it's become as ubiquitous as it has is people working in Silicon Valley, a place, creating ideas, innovations, and spreading them out. In the UK, this is true as well. The evidence shows uh, our cities drive the economy. The 64 largest cities account for around 60% of the jobs of the GVA, three quarters of the knowledge intensive, the most highly skilled jobs. But it's also true that the contribution, as has been said very significantly, uh, if you look at the nine largest English cities, as has been said, they account for over half of English GVA. If you look at some of the fastest growing smaller cities like Milton Keynes and Brighton, they've grown well above the national average in recent years. And at the same time, you've got cities like Hull, which have been struggling uh, for decades to rise to the challenges of quite a, a rapidly changing economy. We also have a situation in the UK where, despite the fact that cities do drive growth, we have, with these nine largest English cities, as was said, seven out of those nine performing below the national average. Now, in a world where cities are driving economic growth, that's not sustainable. It's not sustainable now, and if you look 10 years in the future, it means the UK is going to fall behind. In an economy which uh, is all about innovation and networks and connections and people working together, we continue to be one of the most centralised countries in the world. So if you look at um, some of the kind of uh, tax raising powers, for example, there's lots of figures on this. One of them, local areas in the UK raise on average about 17% of their money. You, I've seen lower figures than that. Across the OECD, it's on average more than half. And actually, there's an awful lot of uh, uh, lack of control over that money. As, as John said, it's actually very difficult to be able to uh, decide how you spend your budgets if you're a city. And so many policies are national and one size fits all, even when they're about places. Housing is a great example of this. Absolutely, we have a national housing shortage. But if you look at places, uh, there are, there's London, there's the South East, have major issues. Other places around the country too, but in Burnley, they don't need new houses. They don't want new houses. They want replacement, they want refurbishment, and they want to be able to take their own decisions about how they spend the money, because otherwise, national money is wasted following national schemes. It doesn't help those people. It doesn't drive the economy. So I think one of the big challenges for the Commission, I know you know all of this, is actually trying to kind of break through that way of thinking about things and get people thinking about what would this look like if we had a different kind of way of doing things where cities are able to spend their own money because actually uh, we have to do this. We know that public spending needs to be reduced over the years ahead. We know that uh, cities can't rely on national government for grants, which historically mm. has been how things have had to operate, whether you wanted to or not. Um, we need to find ways to reduce spending and to do more. And I think one of the interesting uh, examples of how you can really do that comes out of things like community budgets. In Manchester, for example, the money saved, 10 million in cashable savings, when you work together on troubled families, joining services up. It's also true to say um, that of that money, about two thirds of the money was invested by local partners. 80% of the savings went straight back to Whitehall. So you've got a, an era in which there's a lot of austerity. We need to save money. Places can do that because they can join things up around people. They can actually respond to what's going on in their economy. But we need to change the structures that enable cities to benefit from some of those investments and make sure that they can uh, reinvest some of that money, not all of it, but some of that money into the local economy. We have to make the most of London. It's a global city. 
it uh, is thriving, it's got an international reputation, it creates a lot of opportunities for the UK. What we also need to do, though, is to make sure that the other cities are complementing it, that they have investment to increase their scale, their impact, so you've got the Manchesters and the Leeds of this world able to respond to the needs of their economy, invest in the infrastructure they need. So actually London and Manchester and Leeds and Sheffield and all the, those major cities, as well as the, as the smaller cities, uh, are able to work together to make the economy thrive. At the moment, it doesn't work like that. Um, and you can see the impact in, in London, congestion, some of the challenges around housing. We need to make far more of the talents and skills of the cities around the country. Not enough people, I think, buy the argument that cities are part of the answer to the questions that the national questions that people are asking about welfare, about immigration, about jobs. So for the Commission, it would be great to see you changing the terms of the debate. It would be great to see you uh, establishing some of the benefits of city-driven economic growth rather than this national focus, and reviewing the way in which labour markets operate at the local level, understanding not just about how to align national decisions with local decisions, but actually about how local labour markets work differently and then connect to make up the national economy. This isn't a national economy made up of local. This is a, uh, an economy that's all about local labour markets that drive economic growth. And I'm, I'm sure you'll make a fantastic contribution to that debate, and we look forward to working with you.